Good morning and welcome to OSW Daily Live. Uh, welcome, welcome, welcome. Hello, Mike. How are you doing, sir? Hey, is it good morning, OSW Almost Daily Live? You said Almost that yesterday. Daily. <laughs> <laughs> Register to me. You should change the name. That's funny. That's Sometimes funny. daily live. Good to yeah. see you, Steve. How are you? Good to see you too, Mike. I'm great. I'm great. And thank you for joining us today. Um, if this is your first time coming across the channel, uh, we like thumbs up. Thumbs up tells YouTube that uh, this is good content and uh, you need to show it to more people. So we like that. So if you uh, are enjoying us and you're enjoying it, please do hit that thumbs up. Please. Uh, also, hit that subscribe button and that notification bell so you alert it to all our coming videos. Yes, we go live most weekdays in the morning. Um, but also, we Open Source Workplace, we provide additional content where we do interviews with influencers in the workplace-related community. So you'll be alerted to all those. So what do we do here at OSW Daily? Well, we review the content that you're going to be talking about today, the things that are in the tips of the tongue, what are in the mindset of everyone who's in this industry and we basically collect that we publish it ahead of time uh, so you can receive a newsletter so you see the content that's coming then you can join us watch on the live stream and participate as a live interactive live stream so there's a link down below if you click on that leave us your information we'll send you those links and information ahead of time and then you can join in if you haven't don't worry we've we'll put the links to all the content that we're going to talk about um, here today so what do we talk about we talk about things that are going on in work workplace productivity and employee experience so yeah so mike wow. we're going to cover That's a lot. lot we're going to cover a well lot done, today well a lot today a lot today all I just, right and i've just thrown up on screen what we're going to be talking about so COVID 19 yeah. obviously is going to change our lives we're going to talk about a Already great has. a great <laughs> video and it sure has man it sure has a great video um discussing microsoft campus with emmanuel daniel uh, fantastic, yes, fantastic video. Um, Jacob Morgan article on uh, how to create organizations um, with ama for amazing people that are inside. We're going to talk about compensation, Mike, but for remote work, and this is going to be interesting. I really, mm -hmm. really like this, and, and this is a really. I've been waiting for someone to put together a piece, a piece like this, and right. uh, and Dan's done a great job putting this together. And then if we get to it, industrious and hotels and how hotels are turning empty rooms into a serviced office or a co-working office, however you want to talk it. So talk about a it. So full it's be agenda, Steve. You full have put agenda. together a full plate for us. Full I am full already. Plate. I am <laughs> very hungry this morning, though, because Good. I'm fasting for a blood test. So I, if you see me get distracted, it's because my stomach is growling. But that's OK. I'll make it. I'll make, You'll it. make it. That's good. That's good. I'm glad to hear it. I'm glad to hear it, Mike. So so what are we going to talk about first? So how COVID will change our working lives. And uh, this is this is it's kind of interesting. So this is from the Institute of Chartered Accountants in England and Wales, and they're talking about COVID in general and how it's going to change a lot of different things about the lives. But I've just taken a couple of snippets where they talk about the office and how the office and how remote working is going to shift. Now remember who this community is for, right? This is content they're creating for accountants. So very different perspective different slant on it so you know do go take a look take a read of the article but actually the contribution is from a mr andrew mawson who we both know and a jorge bear at I, I may have got his pronunciations highly likely that i have it's a tough but one it is a tough one especially for for us uh, folks from belfast you know but that's right you know, irish folks there you go there you go so i mean a lot of the the information here that andrew's put forward it's, it's stuff we've talked about in the past um, but there's a few things that I do want to pick up, two things notably. So big professional services, he makes the note that central London, they're reducing their, their office space by 25%. Um, while I understand that that's the case, I actually think they were on that path anyway. You know, if we look at EY, really? KPMG, I think they were going down that route of, well, we don't really want our employees in the office, so we want them in our client's office. So really, we're trying to reduce our square footage. And I think a lot of professional service firms are going down that road as well. So I think this may just be a continuation of their existing plans. COVID may have accelerated some of those thoughts. Mm -hmm. But I don't think this is game changing in the sense that um, it's altering their strategies um, from what they were currently the path they're on. The next one is really interesting. So the city of Milan is planning for 2040 to create communities for businesses around hubs so people can actually commute 20 minutes, walk 20 minutes 
to an office. Now that is right. that is pretty um, that's pretty game changing in a sense of you know creating these small hubs 20 minutes from your home now granted the public system public transport system in milan would be very different to many U u.s cities but mike as you think about it you know do you think that would work for like your i office or for other companies that you know the networks that you participate in 20 wait, maybe maybe not 20 minute walking maybe it's 20 minute driving and then if you think about that you take that a step further then if, if everyone is commuting within 20 minutes or walking 20 minutes you know, the article is on top of it, then you're creating a bubble, a bubble in a sense that no one moves outside that community. And then what are the, mm -hmm. what are the other factors that knock that on? You know, so it's, it's, it's a really, it teases the mind to go a little bit further. Yeah, these articles always get me kind of thinking and then I say, wow, that really makes a lot of sense. But then I take a step back and re I'm reminded of the things that we miss out on. And one of the things you just mentioned there is the diversity of experience and people and and just the things that go on in the big city that made them so attractive is something that we lose if we start and we and we are beginning to see that migration away from cities i guess uh but again it's all during covid and and will this be the thing that lasts beyond the pandemic and i, I guess that's what i'm hesitating hesitating about a lot of these articles we read are making some declarative statements about what will happen and i just I'm not quite convinced that people are going to uh, change that dramatically. But but as you said, some of these trends we've seen before the pandemic. So mm. as far as the densification of offices and, and reduction of real estate, that was something that was going on before because we did have a mobile and flexible workforce, certainly not to the extent that we have experienced over these last four or five months while everyone's we're working from home practically. But but that trend was there we wanted to accommodate people's schedules and 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 move people in and out and have those activity-based workplaces so uh, i love andrew mawson i love his thoughtful commentary and i agree with much of what he says and, and I, d I definitely think he's on the right track in this article where he talks about some of the uh you know the need that people will still want to get back to an office at least a, a couple days a week and there are some things that we do together in physical spaces that you can't do remotely. Now, as far as the hub situation, I guess for for I office in, in Houston, again, it's ge it's geography, right? And it's the city. Houston's a spread out city already, and do people do commute long ways? But they don't use public transportation for the most part, from what I understand, because it's so spread out. Um, it's a lot different than New York or even here in Washington D.C. So, what mm -hmm. do you think, Steve? You've you've kind of had this thought for a long time. In fact, I remember way back at the very beginning of our conversations, you were talking about this idea of, of decentralization and, and hubs, and it was you were the first one to tell me about it. Do you think it's practical for, for New York, or you saw it already happening? No, it's and while, while you give me the credit, I have to give the credit to Andrew Segel, who, who was the person who raised the idea and the concept to me. But basically, you know, he's Boxer Property, who operates out of Texas, uh, and also a lot, a lot of other cities around around the US and he sort of said this is the trend that he think is going to happen so that's where the concept really came from and 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 I look at it and I just ask myself a simple question you right yes I work my you know the office is in New York City I live outside to get to the office I have multiple modes of transport that I need to take to get to the office do I think the office will be safe when I get to the office yeah probably it, more than likely it'll be safe would I feel safe in that office yeah would my experience be in that office be the same as what I remembered it to be no because things have changed in there and that's and that's one thing but the barrier for me is the getting to the office the the fear factor the safety factor in that commute time and we've spoken that at length then the other hesitance to me is okay so that's a 90 minute commute one way for me 90 minute commute way back that's three hours of my day is that a productive use of my time and that's where things come from and I think that's sort of while we think yes the office is great and it has tremendous value it's three hours where i'm looking at myself as a commodity can i give more value in those three hours if i work from home and i have the ability to do headstone work and those are some of the things that are going to come through but from a community perspective would i yeah. be more willing to walk to something that's 20 minutes away would i be more willing to get into my car and drive something that is 10 15 20 minutes away uh, absolutely I would be more willing to do that if I was then going into, the question comes, if I am I going into 
a building that is for my company that is not shared with yeah. anybody else or am I getting into a building there. that is shared with other people and what are their behaviors and what are the protocols and what are the standards that they're being kept to so there are multi layers to this question and these are some of the things that I think we all have to, to look at the other aspect when I think about New York City I also then look at it and go well will large apartment buildings where people feel safe because they feel safe it's their building they get to know the people and whenever you know people you get to feel more comfort and you feel more safe could some of those apartment buildings then offer they offer business centers today but would they be open to operating or offering uh co-working or a place to work that's a little more permanent than a business center that allows you to go so you're still in the same building you're going to share it with people you know people you see every day people who you maybe see in your building's gym or in your building's terrace or whatever it is is that something that we may see in the future i don't know but these are just some of the things that sort of sparked my thought process when i read what was mentioned about what milan are doing and some of their mindsets around it well the question for me is who's in that space with you if you're mm. commuting that to that hub which is just a 10 or 20 minute walk or, or ride your bike, Steve, let's put you yeah. in this situation. <laughs> how many of your colleagues from NASDAQ would be there? I mean, how many do enough of them work in your uh, part of, where are you on, Long Island or where yeah, are you? I Long can't Island, remember yeah. Where you are. yeah. Long, Long Island, Island yeah. I imagine there's, there's some of your colleagues are out there, but which ones and are they the right ones that you would want to be collaborating with and ideating with? And, you know, are, are those the team members you'd, you'd need to meet with in person anyway? And if not, then then certainly there's value in, in seeing people and community. And then in the broader sense, these co-working spaces, we're trying to capture that idea of community uh, with just random people that mm. you could interact with. But it sounds like it's going to be a hard, you know, thing to replace the idea of our team, our organization, the culture gathering together. Mm. Maybe it can be done. And, and some huge organizations probably have enough, you know, of an employee base to spread out and, and have these hubs where they can they can have certain people come together to certain from certain regions, but but most companies aren't aren't that many people and and if you start setting up little hubs I, I don't know how that works but but there's two different questions there and I guess it's something we'll explore in the future as these things start coming to fruition. Yeah, and you you, meant, you do mention a couple of really really important things. So right? different size different size of companies will be operating differently for sure, right? You know, you, those who have that single office will likely continue to have that single office and may not want to move to a distributed our hub system, right? Hub and spoke system, or however you want to call it. Um, so that's that's it is an important thing. But whenever you use the example, you know, using me as the example, well, how many of my team or how many people do I interact with when I do go into the office? You know, large organizations, very distributed teams, very distributed workforces, they all work in buildings around the world. So meetings are not always face to face anyway. Um, so therefore, you know, it, it's you, you sort of the argument of, well, if you go into your local community hub, will that, well, you don't have the same experience as if you go into that central hub in a, in a big city. But actually, a lot of teams are distributed around the world because that's just how we recruit. That's just how organizations have people. So it's, but it's it's really important. It is a really good point you you make there, Mike. And yeah, and then why not do that from home or or what have yep. you? There are yep. benefits. There, yep. there are benefits to each level, and we'll we'll yep. I'm sure get into some of those later. But it's an interesting it's an interesting article for sure. It is. It is, and stimulated some conversations. So so this is um, this is. Uh, I, I don't know if you how well you know Emmanuel Daniel. I've I've sort of had some experience with him, some exposures, had some conversations with him. The guy is amazing. You sat on a panel with him, didn't you once at I did one say, of these events? I, I, yeah, I, I I did, and I, well, no, I, I don't think it was on. I think he was he was in the, is part of the um, he was part of the network, but I don't think I actually was on a panel with him. But he okay. is uh, he is one of the smartest people that you will likely meet. And when it comes to buildings, when it comes to workplaces and, and curating experiences, physical environments augmented with technology. Uh, this is something that everybody needs to watch who is interested in building a new workplace or looking what the future of work is to really understand the view of um, how you create that experience, how you think about technology and how technology should be integrated. And the mindset and, and listen to the the words that he uses, the tones he uses, because it's really important, because it's all about delivering an experience for the employees today and tomorrow. How 
can you think of, this is Microsoft in Redwood where they're building out I believe it's 17 buildings they're building out at the moment I think it's like two and a half million workplace square feet is what mm -hmm. they're trying to accommodate and and the video does a huge lovely campus, fly through yeah. it's huge campus right but what they're trying to do is build it for the future but they want to make it evolve right so how do you build a infrastructure that evolves with technology as technology evolves over the time because we may build workplaces that are like for three five ten years Daniel's basically working on a program to build buildings going to be around for the next 20, 25 years. So how do you build that infrastructure? What is the mindset you use? How do you, how do you provide an experience where you have people who work from home? How do you then bring them into the office? When they come into the office, there's value. Technology takes away all friction. And you basically, it helps you navigate through your work day and also provides you interaction with your colleagues and so on and so forth. So it is... A phenomenal, a phenomenal uh, video that I would encourage everyone to go and watch. It is an hour 40 minutes. I am only halfway through it. It is a yeah. lot to digest. I'm halfway through it, but I'm going to go watch it again because, again, it's all about the words he uses. It's all about the tone. It's all about the deliverable. What is the outcome? What is the question he's trying to answer for Microsoft? And then they get into all these various technologies and how these technologies are going to evolve. So there's just so much in there. So... Yeah, it's it's phenomenal. Yeah, I had the privilege, Steve, of visiting the Microsoft campus mm. uh, in Redmond, Washington. Uh, interviewed Brian Collins, who yes, you've met, I'm yes, sure. Yes. Another guy with an Irish accent from, yes. from Dublin, not from Belfast, but uh, I'm sure you had uh, some good times with him. Yeah. He uh, he is really uh, an impressive guy, and, and the entire campus, and this was about a year, year and a half ago that I was there, the plans they had, the models they had, the ideas they had put in place for this new modern uh, workplace and campus was was really amazing. And I am anxious to see uh, the rest of this video. I saw a little bit of it. It's a, it's a lot to digest, but uh, there's a lot of great content out there, Steve. And, and there's guys like us, uh, this guy, Mike J. Walker. I'm interested in seeing more of his work. I scrolled through yep. his past interviews. He's interviewed some people that I've interviewed. So I'm not sure what his uh, story is, but but well done him for mm -hmm. putting together uh, an interview with Emmanuel, and uh, and I've seen him speak at I think some other conferences too. Um, really interesting stuff. The, the inside story, folks. If you want to hear about smart buildings and someone who really gets it and has a, a global perspective with obviously one of the biggest companies in the world, uh, highly recommended. Yeah, and one of one of the uh, topics they did talk about was data privacy, and and we have talked at length about data privacy. You know, yeah. will we provide our content, our data to our employers or to other people, be it you know the state that we operate in, so that you know you take all the contact tracing or anything else that data can be can be used for. And a concept they talked about, which I thought was interesting, was so on your phone you have the ability to have all your data on your phone. Now, whenever you download an app, you have the ability to select when that app can access your data, right? So you, you go into Uber, you can have Uber on all the time, or you can have it only, you can access my data when I open the app. Now, they've taken sure. that and they went, okay, so what if you did that for your employer in a sense of all your data is on your phone, we go into your employer's office, then actually the data then gets taken ingested by the organization so they can work out what all that contact tracing is, all your preferences, what your calendar looks like, all that information. Um, it can be anonymized if you wanted to go that route, but then it on, they only held it for a period of time, maybe while you're in the building or for a 24 hour period and then it gets eliminated. So the whole point is sort of, let's share data as a, as a concept to help everybody, uh, but then people don't feel like they're giving everything up. It was an interesting idea. That's got to be the value proposition, right? We all are going to make that decision. And then once we made the, make the decision that there's value in using this app or using this tool or giving information to someone, I, I think most of us, if you're like me, you just don't think about it too much. In fact, I see all those warnings on my phone every time I mm. turn on an app or install a new app and they say, do you want, you know, this app is using your location, for example. Would you like to let them continue only while the app is running, so forth and so on. Your your level of sensitivity or, or worry about that, at least for me, goes down if you have in your mind that this app is worth it to me. I have this right. app on my phone because it's bringing me something of value. Uber, Uber Eats, whatever it might be. Uh, Chick-fil-A for me, huge one. You know, They need <laughs> to know who I am so I can get my order put in and, mm. and get that milkshake. Um, but, yeah, I think it's a, it's a value 
exchange proposition and and most humans most people at least that i know uh some are very protective of their data and will always opt out but if you if you find a way to deliver that experience in the workplace um and that trust is there again we talk about trust when it comes to privacy and and data uh, it's about a culture of trust and and saying yeah we're your best interests are at heart here we're trying to create a, an employee experience a workplace experience that's going to bring you uh, what you're looking for as an employee. So let's uh, let's opt in and then not think about it anymore. Yeah, and, t- and talking about trust, let's it just molds nicely on to the next article. Um, and this is Jacob It's called Morgan. a segue, Steve. That's a radio segue. Is that uh, a radio I'm segue? Deal- you're dealing with a pro here. I know I am. I know I am. I I'm no still idea. learning the ropes. I'm still learning the ropes. <laughs> so I, I appreciate the education and uh, the, the little nudges when they, when they come up. What did I Mike. stumble into? <laughs> so, uh, so, so this is a Jacob Morgan article. It was based on an interview he did with Gary Hamill. Uh, uh, Gary is a he's a he's a New York bestseller. He's written five books, and um, this is just a snippet of of his actual article. And, and there's only a few elements I want to touch on. Um, so the other the opening line is leaders do not trust their people. Um, mm, that's kind of interesting. And I'd love to know if you know people are watching their comment. Like if they comment, do you think your leaders trust their people? And you know, it then follows that up. Well, if 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 leaders don't trust their people, then how do they expect their people to really deliver? Right. That's the that's the consensus, right? And if people don't trust, if leaders don't trust their people, then what do they do? Right. They micromanage. They observe. They're over the top of, and then with that. Elim- autonomy is eliminated. Motivation is eroded, and it's it's a really interesting thing. And and you know, CEOs obviously this this states here. Eighty seven percent of CEOs think innovation is a top three priority, but ninety four percent will tell you the organization is not very good at it. Um, mm. and and sort of where yeah. my head was, you know, Mike, you you've worked at you know with both work at organizations. You've previous side hustles where you had full autonomy in everything that you did. I'm right. in a position where I've got my day job at NASDAQ and I've got open source workplace. And it's very different. And I love to know your perspective of what that autonomy when you're running your own thing, the freedom you feel in your mind uh, compared to when you're trying to deliver uh, an organizational outcomes. And, and I know we're walking on dangerous territory as, as we sort of talk about these things so feel free to yeah. navigate gingerly around the, around around this the question but uh i'm an open book steve i'm an open book <laughs> but i get your point and, and that issue of trust is interesting especially first let me talk about the uh, idea of being a entrepreneur on of uh, fully autonomous you know running your own business where you are mm-hmm. your own boss and no, no one's looking over your shoulder you've got to trust yourself at that point you become that the person that, that makes all these decisions. And if you don't want to get out of bed and get work done, you know, your business isn't going to last very long. So certainly um, the idea there is no one is looking over your shoulder and you are self-motivated and you have a buy-in because this is your thing. But at that point, I always looked at my customers as my as my boss or my mm-hmm. leader because it's like I was responding to their needs and, and their interests, right? So now I place myself in an organization where I am part of a team and I have been hired to do a job and deliver uh, a product and, and, you know, they trust me to do that. And that's what's been great for me. Certainly my experience at iOffice these last two and a half years almost is that from day one, uh, they were like, listen, uh, we're not going to babysit you. We, we trust you. We know what you're capable of. We've seen what you do. And we just want you to do that for us very well. And and there's never been any micromanaging or anything like that going on. So so that's a culture question for, mm. for many of us. If you're not in that position, you know, that's unfortunate. You maybe need to find a place where you are trusted to do, do what you could do. But you have to demonstrate that you are trustworthy. So I know it's that oh, that pull and the push and pull and the, the tug of war uh, as human beings, because some people, you know, you know, need to be pushed along, and some people uh, are are moving themselves along uh, in this world. And um, I think that's a challenge. I, I've never been good at management. I've never managed a big uh, group of people, and I'm sure you have more experience here than I do. That there, are, and again, we don't want to talk about specifics too much. But in broad terms, you've got you know a, a diverse group of people 
Um, and different personality types, different motivation levels, different, you know, experiences and, and roles and responsibilities. Some are self-starters and will, will, you know, take a project and run with it without much uh, need for direction. Others need more direction. Doesn't mean that's a bad thing. Just means there's different management styles necessary. And I just hope that, that we do, um, this, this idea that leaders don't trust their employees, I, that generalization is one that was a little bit shocking to me. How about you? Yeah. Oh, no, no, 100%. It was like, it was quite, uh, yeah. I mean, that's it, that was like the thing that got my attention with this. Um, and it goes on to explain, um, and I've yet to watch the video, to be fair, to see the full context of of what that's been said. As you know, all good, all good um, journalists you know, um, know how to capture the attention of people. And, uh, and perhaps <laughs> that's what it'll click there. For so, you, so, certainly got me, certainly got me. But you know, if, if we take the sort of concept, what's been said, that um, leaders don't trust them, how does that then get applied to this virtual environment where managers struggle to see more feel more, and that must add to additional stress, because the other oh, side yeah, of it is, yeah. you know, leaders have to deliver, right? That's their responsibility, they deliver for the organization. So how do they get comfortable? And most of the anxiety of leadership comes when they don't have that clarity or can see the entire picture because they're trying to manage a band, an orchestra, right? And if certain parts aren't playing properly and they don't have the ability to be able to see that, that's where stress comes in. And that stress and anxiety is actually what then sort of requires not requires it brings out that micromanaging that's sure. within us all right it's within us all reaction it's a reactive thing right you know in the moment if you feel a, that sense of panic you might do mm. something that you know is not the best managerial choice yeah interesting yeah. stuff yeah yeah and then we're going to move on to the sort of the last one just given just given the time mike we'll just we'll just cover this one. Oh wow we're almost out of time steve i know i know it's just flying by right um so this is a really interesting article and as i said this is this is a huge piece that um dan's put together i encourage people to go and read it because he talks around all aspects of remote working but i just wanted to pull out a couple of snippets and this one question would you take a pay reduction to work from home permanently and he pulled on linkedin and this is the results 28 percent and he also then goes okay so here are here are why people may leave San Francisco. And we've talked about the last couple of weeks how, you know, we believe there is a migration out of San Francisco because of some of the key indicators we're seeing around, you know, rents and so on and so forth. And he's comparing what those costs are in these other locations. Um, now, if, if that is what is happening, why wouldn't organizations take the opportunity to take a lower cost? Meaning, right. part of a leadership responsibility is to deliver a product at the most affordable, right? Or the, or the, the least cost, right? The most efficient, most effective, and usually most profitable way. And if you are an employee and you're in New York City, San Francisco, well, it's almost the leadership's responsibility to try and, well, if you're going to, we pay for that, that service in San Francisco and for New York, but in other parts of the country, we don't pay those levels. So therefore, it's almost a leadership's responsibility. The argument that Dan's putting forward actually is, no, what the organization's paying for is productivity. They're paying for an outcome. And therefore, why would that cost be reduced? It's, it's a fascinating thought. I'd love to hear mm -hmm. what your thoughts are on some of these things, you know, because uh, my mind was spinning as I was going through this because there's just so much. Yeah. I'm trying to condense it down to come up with one or two questions or one or two talking points in the timeline was was such a challenge <laughs> now everybody out there needs to read this article and follow the link below check it out because it opens that question that we brought up several days ago maybe it was a week ago about remote work and who wins is it is it going to be better for employers mm -hmm. or is it better for employees and mm -hmm. i was saying as you were you know excited about the prospect of of being able to work from anywhere and therefore uh, the opportunity as an employee to you know, live outside of the big high cost city centers or metro areas and, and still do your job is, is certainly exciting, especially if you're getting paid the same amount you were getting when you lived in New York or San Francisco. Right. But right. it sounds like from this article, some of my concerns about the fact that, well, an employer is not going to pay somebody New York or San Francisco rates if they're living in Omaha, Nebraska. So the idea being it's a two-way street, and, and I don't know where that pendulum sh shifts. I, I think there is benefits 
uh, to the employee. There are benefits to the employer as well because they can now recruit from anywhere. So that whole idea of outsourcing becomes an, an interesting conversation. But as an employee, you also have the opportunity to work for, I could work for a company in San Francisco or anywhere as a remote worker. Uh, I work for a company that's in Texas. So mm -hmm. I, I see it both ways and, and the article goes into all those things. And, and the big quote that did jump out at me was, I think it was Zuckerberg or, or one of the big tech firms said uh, they are beginning to look at uh, reevaluating salaries and, and making them location or ge geographic uh, yeah. sp uh, specific or something like that which indicates that, yeah, they get the idea that this is not going to be, you know, status quo. We'll keep paying you the the high uh, rate of income you're making in, in San Francisco uh, or in the Silicon Valley area I'm, if you're going to move out to uh, another part of the country. So it's an interesting conversation for sure. Yeah, it'll be interesting to see how employees gamify this, right? So, for example, if you're in you know San Francisco and you want to move not you know, out of San Francisco, but to another, you know, bit 30, 40 minutes outside San Francisco in a cheaper area, then just how does that get adjusted, if adjusted at all? And, and it'll be interesting to see how uh, employees think about gaming this because you know this is going to happen. Like, <laughs> Oh, yeah. <laughs> you know, but... Uh, What's in it for me, Steve? What's of course, <laughs> of course, Mike, of course, of course. Well, our so, time, man, that wow. went by way too fast. That's really fast. And there was a lot of content in there, a lot of really good content. So please do go Stop. check out the links. Um, do some, If you do want to receive this content ahead of time, um, do, do fill out. There's a little link there. Click on the link. Give us your information. We'll send it to you every morning. And uh, But if not, look, thank you. Appreciate you joining us today. Mike, thank you for your time and insights as always. Have a wonderful always day. Always a pleasure, sir. Have a great day. <laughs>